I would say that um, what this generation, I would even say my generation uh, and, and your generation and then the generation after you, I think it are increasingly saying the same thing, hmm. which is we don't just want a theology of love, we want a demonstration of love. Hey, before we jump into this video, I just want to say thanks for checking us out. We at the Canadian Church Leaders Network exist to see a hopeful future for the church in Canada by serving, connecting, and resourcing pastors. And so if you're a church leader in Canada and you could benefit from more resources or connecting with other leaders across the country, check out our website at ccln.ca, follow us on Instagram at Church Leaders Network, or hit subscribe below. Thanks again, and I hope this video is helpful and encouraging. Well, Danielle, I am really, really grateful for you taking time to be with us today. Um, there's so many things, really. I was thinking about what I'd love to chat with you about, and the list just got longer and longer. And I think that's because, like, you, for me personally, like, whether it's through conversations we've had or hearing you speak, like, you continue to help me see things clearer, um, mm -hmm. things that either I'm missing or things I'm seeing foggy. And you've been doing that not just for me, but for the church in Canada, around the world. And so I'm just really so grateful for you that you continue to use your voice and for making time to be with us today. Oh, thanks. It's a joy to be with you. Thanks and for I asking know, me. And I know you're doing tons of these. And so thanks for taking time to speak to this audience of pastors here in Canada and around the world. And so before we jump into some of the ideas, I just give us a little bit of a picture of your world, uh, your family and the things that have your attention these days. Sure. So uh, like everybody, I'm, I'm at home uh, for months and months. This is actually the <laughs> longest time I've ever been home in my whole life, I think. Uh, so I've got three boys and uh, I, we have another girl who lives with us. And uh, we, we did have a full house. We had a, a couple from Nigeria that had just uh, were newcomers to Canada that were also living with us during the lockdown. But they just got an apartment uh, this month. So we're excited to get a tiny bit more space. Um, yeah. And so I speak and I'm trying to write. I don't know how anybody gets any writing done when they're at home. <laughs> this is the thing I discovered. I realized I do all my work strapped into an airplane. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I got to figure out a way to like strap myself in somewhere to get some work <laughs> done because this is hard. I, I think that's why people's book publishing goes up after the kids move out. I think that's a piece of the puzzle. Right. I'm like, I don't know. How does anybody get anything done when they're <laughs> staying at home? It's crazy. And you've got different like ministry and business expressions, um, infinitum mm -hmm. life, amplify peace, brave. Can you just tell us a bit about those different things that are kind of all extensions of really your passion for others? Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's kind of easiest to call me a kingdom entrepreneur because they just keep coming. But uh, Women Speaker Collective is a, a movement that is trying to empower female communicators. Um, and we just uh, hosted a pivoted to an online open uh, conference called Boundless Voices, which we're going to do again. It was it was off the charts, really exciting in terms of just this moment too. like even so technical conversations about talking to camera and setting up a podcast and stuff and open to men and women, uh, oh, but primarily led by women. So it's a, also a fantastic step forward in terms of learning how to do things differently. Uh, and then Amplify Peace, which is a movement of peacemakers. And mm. uh, this is a engagement, it's, a, it's teaching, it's empowering, it's global immersions, encounters, local encounters that we host to help people to discover what it means to be a peacemaker in their own community. Mm. And that's been, I mean, that's just such a deep, deep love of mine. I just, it's amazing. And Brave Global, which is a, a movement to empower communities to reach vulnerable girls before they're trafficked. And again, uh, we just launched actually a thing called the Brave Leadership Academy, which is a longer journey. So brave churches can nominate a girl and a mentor to go through this two-year sort of wow. uh, leadership equipping course, uh, which we're super excited. So we're just piloting that right now. It's kind of exciting. And uh, what else? What else is going on? Oh, Infinitum. This is like yeah. uh, Infinitum, which is a way of life, which is rhythms and postures that help me practice my faith daily. Uh, and again, Infinitum, it's been a wonderful time during this season to open it up to sort of some more global engagement. So we had mm. 200 people do a 30-day challenge with us. Just We just finished last week wow. uh, from 12 different nations. And we all journeyed together for 30 days, practicing the rhythms and the intentional practices of Infinitum. It was the mm. game changer for a lot of people. So we're super excited. And I, just hot off the press, we haven't announced it yet, but we are going to do the world, a world a global infinitum family camp in your own backyard. 
So Tell stay me about tuned that. for this. Yes, you're going to love this. So the idea, we were going to have a family camp and sort of one of my big deals is how we segregate our lives from our discipleship. So we, we have this understanding somehow, this mixed idea that our discipleship is separate from our parenting, which is separate mm. from our families, which is separate from our work, which is separate from. And so we, you know, we pay attention, even the church, we do this a lot. The kids go here, the adults go there. And we don't do a lot of sort of integrated discipleship, which I think is what discipleship is supposed to be anyway. So we wanted to do this family camp where we come together and we're not going to segregate your kids. We're going to do things together, active mm. things, engaged things, but with spiritual lenses. So, and mostly just with debrief, right? So the prayer time in the morning would be like sort of a stretching session with our posture prayers and we'd all do it together. And, and then there would be like, um, you know, there's a zip line at the camp and it would all be about trust and surrender. We ask questions after you're done the thing, you know, just interactive sort of stuff that we do together as families. And then we had to cancel because of the COVID thing. But then we thought, you know what, maybe there's a lot of families that are stuck now without camps, without church, without. So what if we just offered this kind of hybrid model of like, we would gather on zoom and maybe do some posture prayers together, have some kids even lead us in some of those sessions And then we would have online just a whole bunch of things you can do at home in your own backyard uh, with your kids that are kind of fun, but Mm. also spiritually uh, minded and through the lens of infinitum, the surrender, generosity of missional uh, living. And uh, so anyway, we're going to try it uh, July, middle of July and uh, see how it goes. Yeah. So fun. Uh, yeah. I should just mention this because sometimes I imagine people like jotting everything down, trying to listen to this podcast. Uh, we're going to put all of the stuff that Danielle references, like these things and anything else for the whole podcast on the blog. So we'll give you links. We'll make it easy to find all this stuff. And uh, because there's a lot of things you've got going on. But let me just say this before we move into some content. Um, there's some prayers that you've released through Infinitum Life that just have really helped me become part of my even daily rhythms of prayer. So super grateful for that. And uh, and as a parent, just hearing you describe that integration, I just see that as a huge challenge for me. You know, it's like mm-hmm. I'm up here in my little office talking about Jesus on here all day. I'm praying, I'm reading my Bible. And then I walk into a room with my kids and my wife and I'm like, I struggle to integrate that. And so it's just like, it's just very honest, uh, like really grateful for that conversation that you're leading. And like, we take attempts at it. And sometimes I'm like, gather around, let's have a conversation about the Bible. And then they just, it's a, they're just gone. And it's, you know, you kind of go, oh, I tried it for the month. And so thanks for leaning into that for us. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you're fun. welcome. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I also, I think everybody does because we taught, we were taught something else, right? So we're trying to learn, relearn uh, sort of the ancient practice of discipleship, which is you know, this centralized, integral, integrated life. So I'm excited about it. It's going to be a pilot. So it's going to be crazy fun, but I'm, I'm pretty pumped. So good. Well, hey, I heard you recently chat about this idea of disruption and disruption seems like one of the COVID buzzwords like pivot or whatever it is. But I heard you talk about disruption and just the importance of disruption for the sake of growth and change. And I just wanted to start there by just unpacking sort of why you feel like disruption is something that we shouldn't like just hope passes, but actually maybe embrace. Yeah, I'll just throw it to you. I'd love to hear a bit more about what you meant by that. Yeah. So Catherine Booth, who co-founded the Salvation Army, uh, said that there is no changing the future without disrupting the present. And uh, she's right. You know, Mm. disruption is, you know, spiritual code for awakening. Um, And I think that we've always, we often, and I think this is probably because of our own addictions to control, you know, like we want to we want to be in charge. We view disruption through the lens of fear right. and it's a threat. It's a threat to what we can control, of course. But if you view disruption through the lens of faith, it becomes an invitation. Hmm. So I think that, you know, no matter the disruption, there is an invitation in it. If you can ask a God to show you what it is that he's trying to invite you into. Uh, and, you know, again, I, I, I wrote a book called, a beautiful mess uh, and really around this idea of how we just said anything that's chaotic is the enemy mm. and order is a friend. And I, I, I think actually there is a divine order that is a deep friend. Of course, that's the creation account, but God's order, divine order is so much different than our order. Mm. And so it's about relinquishing a lot of the control and the need for us to to figure out and to know what's going on and to surrender that to God, who actually does have a divine order that he's inviting us to find. And in the original creation account, of course, it says the spirit hovered over the chaos 
and then spoke life out of it. So again, this idea that that chaotic void, which is both uh, uh, empty, you know, this feeling of like, there's nothing here, uh, which I think some people can relate to. And it's also the presence of this foreboding, like this is going bad. So it's Mm. both. Uh, it's the absence of any kind of meaning, but it's also this like presence of like fear in that spot, that chaotic place, the spirit of God was hovering, Hmm. just waiting to create. And I think that's the image I'd like to tell people like in those places where either you're, you've got nothing (laughs) or there's this foreboding sense of like, I'm, you know, darkness and death and deep, uh, right there is where the spirit of God is. And Hmm. we've been trained our whole lives to avoid those places. Uh, because they're scary and they're out of our control. But maybe, just maybe, if we could ask God to help us, we could hover there too with the Holy Spirit and see what he might want to create. Mm. And help us make sense of some of the disruption we're feeling around us this week, this month, this season. Yeah, I mean, I've got uh, lots of friends who have said this COVID season, you know, is sort of a a globally forced Sabbath. Hmm. Um, and I would say, you know, we, we, we buy it. We're all economically bought into a billion dollar industry that is virtually just distracting us from ourselves. And all of a sudden we're like, Oh, okay, well we can't do that. So, and I mean, there still are internal ways of distracting from yourself, but I feel like never before, at least in my lifetime, has there been this amount of time for us to press pause and to stop and to actually be able to think about what, what really matters, uh, what I'm even doing and why I'm doing it. And do I want to do it later or not? And is it, you know, uh, the things that actually are underneath the surface, some Mm. of the deepest, deepest things about what it means to be human. What about even life and death and mortality? And uh, I mean, all those things that we just push away and rage against in a distracted life. Uh, here we are for months Mm. now. And, uh, you know, we were talking before, but I think that even this season that we're in of, you know, this, this Black Lives Matter, this BIPOC, you know, the black and indigenous and people of color, uh, and this, this moment that we're in that I think is a real invitation. It's a disruption, a divine disruption of life as normal and this invitation to take on racism, Hmm. uh, as a demonic force of evil in our society, uh, Wow. Like, I don't think we would even have been here if we didn't have months of Mm. getting to deeper places Interesting. and really asking the question about what kind of world we want to live in. What kind of a life do we want to live? What do we want to do uh, with our lives? What do we want to give to our kids? You know, I think some of this existential angst that's come to the surface uh, is actually, we're seeing an overflow of that in this. We, here's what we don't want. We don't want racism. Yeah. I heard you say um, this is the greatest invitation of our time and that you want us to stop praying that this would pass, but to pray that this would do everything it was intended to do. Can you just, because you you just said like, man, this isn't a moment, but like this is, or this is an invitation, but the greatest invitation in our lifetime. I just love to hear like that's, those are bold words. And I think I agree, but I just want to hear more from you about that. Well, I mean, this is global. It's a global movement. Uh, I mean, all 50 states have had, and, and that, like countries all around the world that, and you think to yourself, what on earth? Like, this isn't even new, you know, like it's tragic. And there is this sort of catalytic moment where we see, and I just think the image of a white police officer literally pressing on the neck of a black man until he can't breathe. Uh, the image is so profoundly, you know, I, I was uh, watching a, a YouTube video of some Syrian painters. So there's these ruins in uh, Syria and there's just this like half a wall standing and that all of it, it is is ruined brick from that civil war. And the, the artist has painted a picture of George Floyd, mm. a tribute to George Floyd. And the, the reporter sort of saying like, what? Like you're a Syrian, you know what I mean? Like right. what is going on? And the guy said, the artist said, George Floyd represents oppressed people everywhere. Uh. And I think that's interesting. Like, uh, the oppressor, you know, whoever that is. And I think, you know, we get into these like flesh and blood battles when really we understand that the principle behind racism, you know, the power behind racism is demonic. We're fighting not against flesh and blood. We're fighting actually against principalities and powers. And so there's this exposing, like this time of exposure of this principality and power. And that's why I'm saying this is the greatest invitation because Mm. It, when you get to exposure, when you can actually bring to the surface what's hidden underneath, you can actually start talking about freedom. You can actually mm. start talking about 
uh, getting people free. But I thought, what an incredible thing that the Syrian oppressed yeah. person understands in that catalytic picture of George Floyd, this cry of the oppressed hmm. uh, to say, we are, we know that feeling. I know what it feels like to be suffocated to death, you know, to have no voice, to have nobody respond, to have this oppression just keep on coming and not give way. Uh, I think that's a cry that's heard all around the world. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing this. Yeah. And I mean, this is the, one of the greatest narratives of the Christian faith is that Jesus come to set us free. Like we're the people who use the, the Exodus story as the big story. Like this is still our story. Like we serve the God who hears the cry. That's literally how God defines himself. I am the God who hears the cry of my people. And then we celebrate, you know, Moses as a great deliverer or someone who goes and helps lead the people into freedom. And then when it comes, we're like, oh, that's a bit divisive or, oh, that's a little too disrupting or, oh, I don't know what I feel. You know, like, it's like, what? Mm -hmm. Do you not read the Bible? Like this is, uh, this is, this is a time. There's no doubt in my mind. This is a, a Kairos moment. Hundreds of years people have been fighting this, bringing this up. We've seen footage before of people dying uh, unjustly all around the world. And it hasn't had this kind of a, Hmm. Uh, this kind of a reaction like this is a god this is a god sized reaction people can't make this happen like george floyd can't make this happen the black lives matter movement cannot make this happen they tried they've been trying for years to make something like this happen they cannot and all of them will say we don't know what's happening hmm. uh and i'll say i know what's happening the spirit of god is hovering over the chaos creating some some new things hmm. you you described it as like a, a demonic root and i just i just find it so helpful trying I'm, I'm trying to reframe so much of what i'm seeing and experiencing through a theological through a christian worldview and just just tell me a little bit more when you when you describe it as a demonic root like how does that impact the way we respond yeah you know it's fascinating i'm, I'm preaching this sunday at the meeting house and uh i'm preaching on mark 5 where jesus goes over to the Gesserines and uh encounters the demon the demoniac uh, and, you know, I, I can't, and then, you know, frees him, sends this uh, legion, the spirit uh, legion into the pigs and the pigs <laughs> drown in the sea. And, that, you know, there's just so many things to say. I don't know how I'm going to do it. But um, just this idea that there is no way to deal with evil. There's no way to deal with sort of that demonic strong man, you know, in Mark's gospel. You know, that's a, who's the, who can release the people from the house of the strong man who holds them. Uh, and the Mark says, of course, a stronger man, you know, mm. that's who can. And, he, and then Jesus then de declares, I'm the stronger man, like have a look. And he starts exercising his authority over demonic powers. And this is one of those instances where he exercises his authority over demonic powers. And it's really interesting because the people of that region had tried to restrain the demons hmm. and then they tried to constrain the demons and what actually needs to happen and this is where jesus enters so you have this guy and it says like they tried to chain his hands and his feet he's running around naked in graveyards like this is like demonic destruction like the, the thief has come to steal kill and destroy so this is what that looks like on an individual level and jesus comes and then says to the demon what's your name hmm. And I thought, I think this is fascinating because you can, this is, and this is what we do when it comes to evil, personal, but also corporate evil is that we constrain or we restrain, right? We try to like restrict it. We try to contain it, but it is powerful. It is too powerful for human constraints or restraints. And that's what we can see. It doesn't matter how many times you reform the police department. There they are again, using a power, a demonic power that's greater than any kind of human power. And then Jesus says, what's your name? And, and, and this is a principle, I think, of spiritual warfare is you cannot ever get free from what you won't name. Hmm. It has to be named, right? And it's not until, and in that passage of scripture, even there is this, there's this fight between Jesus and the demons in many ways, actually more of a fight than is, is uh, portrayed in the English translation, but it's like this wrestle, it's this fight. Hmm. And Jesus gets the authority when he gets the name, when he names the, the demon. Wow. And I think this is a spiritual principle that's true of anything. If you think about this, even in your own life, but it's true corporately too, unless we name it, we can't, we can't get free of it because it remains hidden. It remains, uh, we keep restraining it. We keep trying to push it down. This is true just even in your own spiritual warfare in your own life. If you can't get honest, if you can't get true, if you can't let that truth come to the center, if you can't confess your sins, 
you cannot be forgiven for your sins. I mean, uh, this is a principle that's so true. And I think this is true not only individually, but I also think it's true in society. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to preach the whole sermon, but uh, tune in if you want to hear more. But the, the name of the demon is Legion, which just also happens to be the name of a Roman military unit that is oppressing the people of God. Hmm. Uh, in Israel. So that's fascinating. The demon's yeah. name is Legion. And then he sends the Legion into the pigs and the pigs go over the cliff and drown in the water. Now, can you think of any other story in the Bible where the enemy drowns in the water? Hmm. Um, anything come to mind? Exodus. Yeah. yeah. Of the, other course. Legion, the other Legion military right. army that was chasing the Israelites trying to oppress them, also get drowned in the water. So there is this kind of like, you know, nuances all through the Bible, but nuances in Mark specifically around Jesus' mm, authority over right, the water as well. Yeah, fascinating. Anyway, it we're, goes on and on. But we're fighting against flesh. Oh, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're fighting against powers and principalities. And racism is an evil, uh, demonic, it's an antichrist spirit. It's uh, not difficult to see that based on, what the church is always supposed to be, how God created the world to thrive with difference. And the New wow. Testament specifically, Jesus out of his way. I mean, this is one of the things about Jesus. And I talk a lot about this when it comes to women, that Jesus defies social norms, that he crosses uh, over religious boundaries, that there is nothing that will stop him. But this is true of everything. This is true of all of all the people with difference. Hmm. You know, this is the Samaritans. This is the Gentiles. I mean, he's hanging out with pig farmers right now hmm. and with a man who's just been in a graveyard. Those are all things you're not allowed to do if you're Jewish or if you're a rabbi, for Pete's sake, you're going to be in, you know, segregation for months after this for the unclean nature of what you've just done and touched and been part of. Hmm. So he has no regard uh, for those things because that's not actually how he created. And then even the early church, the Pentecost came and what happened? They all got... Uh, Tongues to speak in other language to push the gospel to hmm. the to the whole world. I mean, diversity, and then of course, Revelation paints the picture of the end. But uh, diversity is at the heart of the kingdom of God. So segregation, racism, sexism, things that separate, things that divide, those are all demonic forces actually hmm. behind those things. So we've got to rage against uh, it. This is what you've been such a challenge for me in a good way, or you've helped me, is I feel like... so. Maybe the counter pushback, I can imagine someone listening in and, you know, taking what we just talked about out of context saying, okay, you're saying it's spiritual, therefore we shouldn't do anything. We just sit in our rooms and pray, never go outside and, and act, never reach out to our neighbor, never protest, whatever. But then I know your life, Danielle, like you've been an advocate. I heard you stand up in front of like 16,000 high school students years ago and say, talk is cheap, love has feet, you know? And so I see this in your life and I think you've helped me because you continue to frame things in a theological uh, Christian worldview, but then you bridge the gap and you say that worldview demands both spiritual fight and actually, and, I, and even as I'm saying, I said both spiritual and practical, but those aren't that separate. And that's, I think that's the myth. And you've helped me really just see that there is like an entering in, we name it for it as demonic, but it doesn't mean we just sit in our room. So we do sit in our room and we pray and we advocate, and then we go out and we build bridges to neighbors. And I just, why do you think that's been such a polarizing framework within the church or within, yeah, with followers of Jesus, where it's, it's either this or either this and missing this sort of integrated view of issues like justice and race or all of these things we're talking about. You know, this is a really interesting conversation because people who do not separate the super spiritual from the practical are the oppressed. Hmm. Uh, you know, so we, you know, in the West, we've been highly critical of the liberation movement, uh, for example, in the south, south of our borders, way south of our borders and stuff like that. And on and on this goes. I think it's really fascinating that the people who most separate the spiritual from the practical outworkings of that are the people that have, uh, you know, control, are the people that are the oppressor, you know, are the people that are the ones that actually, like the rich young ruler, have the most to lose, uh, the cost is too high, you know, so even in the story I was just talking about, which by the way is a physical story, Jesus doesn't spiritually pray, f you know, from a distance, he goes, he goes out of his way to get in the way, mm. he goes across a lake for Pete's sake to get to a region where he knows, you know, there's going to be some resistance and there's going to be a confrontation. And then even in the confrontation, so I would say even something like a protest is a it's, it, it's a it's a confrontation with the principality of racism. That's what's happening. That's why it's so powerful. If anyone hasn't gone, you should go and just be part of that because there's something powerful happening there. Yeah. What's happening there is there's a confrontation with a spirit, 
right? There's a spiritual application to a physical truth. And, um, but even there, the farmers, the pig farmers, you know, say to Jesus, please leave, please leave, you know, cause in the end, the cost is too great. Hmm. Uh, in the end, they're not willing to give up, uh, the way that they built their life. They built their life around feeding the oppressor. There's no pigs going to Jewish people in Israel. All the pigs are feeding the, uh, Romans. Hmm. So they're, they're, they built their community around feeding the oppressor. And now Jesus has just destroyed that, uh, that crop. <laughs> and they're saying, get out of here. I, we don't want you here. Even when they've witnessed the miracle of this oppressed, demonically possessed individual, completely free, they don't want Jesus to stick around. And I think this is a fascinating conversation. Do we want Jesus to stick around? You know, are we willing to like, are we willing to put people over profits or people over program? Are we willing to hear the cries of people, even if it means we might lose something and have to make amends? You know, like this is what repentance leads us to. So these, I mean, these are hard. I get it. These are hard things, but this is the invitation. You yeah. know, this, this is the invitation. And I think it's, you know, in my book on the Exodus, I talk about how, you know, I've never heard anybody preach on the Exodus without identifying with the Israelites. Hmm. But if you actually think about it, the Israelites are an oppressed people group. The dominant superpower that was oppressing them is Egypt. And if you think about the way our life works, the Western world, I mean, we're Egypt. We, we, what do we have in common with an oppressed people group? Like we're the ones with the power, like we're the ones with the money, we're the ones with the workforce, we're the ones hiring people, you know what I mean? Like we're the ones that are driving the cotton industry where Bangladesh women are and children are sold by the millions. Uh, and you know, what we want is a dollar t-shirt, you know what I'm saying? Like that's, and so um, when Moses comes, when a pat, oppressed person comes to us, who Moses, by the way, is part of the oppressed people group, he comes and he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, no, absolutely not, because I'm not willing to change the way my economy works. I'm not willing to change the way the system works. I'm not willing to change the way Egypt's power and glory is. And this is what this is the battle that's going on mm. between Moses and Pharaoh. So I often say, you know, are we willing? Like, if, if we want to really look through the Book of Exodus, you know, can we listen to George Floyd, right? And Black Lives, and or even in Canada, particularly Aboriginal lives. I mean. The indigenous peoples of Canada are remain the most oppressed people group uh, in our history. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. It's systemically unbelievable to me that we cannot see that. And but we won't. They say, "Let my people go," and we're like, "Yeah, but that's you're asking too much. We don't want to change the way we do life. We don't want to change the way we do business. Our economy uh, needs the pipeline. I mean, on and on this goes. You know what I mean? Like we just, yeah." So I think if we're really going to read the Bible in a way where we enter the text, we should at least try to yeah. enter the text all the way. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people listening are pastors, um, churches across Canada, some around the world and their teams, and they're thinking about the part they have to play in this movement. And um, I've noticed that like even this last Monday, so a week before this is going to be released, I saw a massive decrease on social media of the engagement around the conversation on racial justice. And if pastors listening, trying to say, Hey, I, I actually do want to engage. I want to fuel the conversation. I don't want this just to go away. Um, but I don't know what to do. You know, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to engage. Just, can you help even just speaking to me? What kind of steps can I take as I'm trying to lead a congregation, big or small and my family and be a leader in my city? What, what kind of, what can I do? What advice would you give me, Danielle? Yeah, I mean, I think um, a couple of things. One, you already mentioned to me that you went. You know, you went. So I always say proximity is king when it comes mm. to the kingdom. Proximity is king. So every, the forces, and this is also, I keep going back to Mark 5 because this is where my brain is. But when Jesus was headed over to the other side, that's when the storm came against him. Mm. And you remember the disciples were freaking out. And that's when the disciples said, do you not care? Uh, Jesus, he was sleeping. Jesus isn't worried because he's in charge. But the disciples come and do you not even care about us? And I was thinking a lot about how to get to the other side, there's a there's always a resistance, even inside of us, because we are scared of what we don't mm -hmm. know. We're scared of people we don't understand. So this is exactly great for, for scared for of being misunderstood. Yeah. Scared, scared of getting, of getting it, it wrong. wrong. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so this is all this fear that exists there. And what I would say is that Jesus is with you. Like mm. that number one, that Jesus is with you, that he's the one that told you to go to the other side. Like this is not, you're not departing from your faith you're being invited into. So number one is know that Jesus is with you. Don't be afraid. This is what practicing your faith means. So I'd say proximity, go. Even if you don't understand, go, because your solidarity means something for you to actually show up and say, I don't know if I'm going to get this right, but I do agree that racism needs to go, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and then I would just say that kind of posture of humility to say, I don't really know how to get this right, but all I know is I want a better world. All I know is I hate racism. All I know is I want racism to go away. All I know is that I probably have benefited from mm -hmm. a system that has white people at the center of it, but I want to change it. And I don't know how, and I don't know if I'm going to get there really super soon, but I'm going to learn. And that's the other thing I say to people, read. There's so many things like, listen, watch, there's like resources of plenty uh, and you've got time. <laughs> you've got time. So get your Netflix out and get your, order your books on a Kindle if they're sold out and get educated on what people are talking about. And, and, and I mean, there's, there are scholars. Amazing. If you haven't read the book, James Cone, the hmm. lynching tree, the cross and the lynching tree, it's unbelievably insightful, theologically deep, beautiful. Hmm. And you do read, you know, I read that book uh, like last year, or two years ago, and I just was like, how did we not think of this sooner? You know, the idea that the lynching tree is also like symbolic of the cross and the deep theology that comes out of like, what does it mean to be a person hmm. uh, that has been part of a lynching community? Anyway, all of those things, so helpful. So I would say learn. And then I would finally, I would just say humility, man, posture, posture, posture. You don't need to fix this. Uh, you just need to acknowledge it needs to be fixed. You need to own your part in it. You need to do some deep work around it. Um, mm. You need to ask for some help. This is why we don't like this part either. You're going to need to ask some people who are not like you to help yeah. you. Uh, and that is the opposite of what we, we want to be in charge and fix everything. This is not fixable by you. Uh, this is going to be fixable by somebody else. So it's going to need, there's going to need to be a, a humility posture shift. Yeah. I just feel like I want to say, uh, I got a lot of, for anyone listening, like I, I see it's a problem. I want to see it go. I don't know how, but I don't want to ignore it. And I don't want the conversation to just sneak by, to slip away. And so just so, yeah, I got nothing to add. Just so grateful for that. And um, yeah, it is, it is, it's humiliating, right? not having answers to a problem that you feel complicit in. Yeah. And then even just to do the work around what does it look like to not only be repentant, but to offer restitution, you know, mm. what can I do to make it right? Um, and, you know, in some ways there's a panic, you know, right now there's a panic for people to go like, Whoa, you know, who are the people of color in my life that I can, get to speak or speak into my life or to help me. And then all the people of color that are friends of mine are exhausted for having to help. Uh, One of my friends, I called him and he just answered the phone and said, guilt. my buddy just answered the phone, just said, no comment, <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Like press is done for the day. Like I'm not, you know, and cause, yeah. cause that is the feeling. And I think a lot of that's well intended to reach out to all that. And part of what I'm thinking that I would love for you to help me just flesh this out is there's a lot of pressure to respond with the right thing now in a two, three week window. I feel like the real win will be two months from now, four months from now, a year from now, being able to continue entering the conversation. What does it look like for us to sort of see this as a long, like not a short sprint, but a long-term thing? Any advice about how to like stay in the game and, and capture the moment for what it is, but also to, to see it extend past just a blip on social media? Well, all long-term strategies have measurable goals, right? So I would say that um, I would start this to get it right right now is to say, I'm sorry, and I hate racism, and I'm going to do some work. You know, that's what's getting it right right now. We're going to do some work. Uh, and then I would set some targets around what that, that work would look like. Um, so we're going to have some discussions around racism. Uh, we're going to have a preaching series around racism, we're going to find some people of color in our community to speak into our community. And I would set some timelines around that. We're going to mm -hmm. find, you know, some people to join our team that are diverse. Uh, that matters to us. And uh, we're going to start finding like, so I just even think like setting some measurable goals for the future to say like, this is how we're going to change some things here uh, could go a long way. 
Mm-hmm. One more question on this theme, and we could chat about it forever long we want. I just, but one question I wanted to make sure I asked was the relationship between justice and evangelism has always been a deep relationship. But I think in particular with Gen Z and this, this generation, the way their lens is towards the world and where they're watching the church asking this question like, are you at all relevant or like, is this relevant to me at all? Can you help us just frame that relationship between justice and evangelism in the context of this emerging generation? Yeah. I mean, one thing I would say, you know, Dr. Cornel West is my favorite. He says it the best where he says justice is love in public. Um, And I love that, you know, justice is a a demonstration of love in a public form. Uh, And I would say that um, what this generation, I would even say my generation uh, and, and your generation, and then the generation after you, I think are increasingly saying the same thing, Hmm. which is we don't just want a theology of love. We want a demonstration of love. Uh, So we want an incarnated theology, which is actually a beautiful desire because it's exactly what God wants (laughs) to. So I feel like the hunger and thirst within a generation to see a demonstrated incarnated theology, like a lived out demonstration of what it is we say we believe, which is reconciliation, which is the lonely in families, which is justice, right? Love in public, which is equality and empowerment. It's all these things. That's what we say we believe. I mean, you just make a list of things you say you believe. All we want to all we want is to see that it's true, that mm. what you believe is real, and that the realness of your belief is not somewhere because it's good theology. The realness, the depth, the the power of your belief is because it's lived. Mm. And this is always true, by the way. This is where all the power has always been. That's why Jesus showed up in human form. Otherwise, he would have just given us another uh, few commandments to follow chiseled in stone by somebody else. But he lived out the, the practices and purposes of God in real life to show us how to do this. So this is the deepest desire of this generation is the deepest desire of God himself. I think it's a beautiful mix. And I don't, I don't know why this has been so difficult. I think maybe it's just because it's more difficult to live out your theology than to actually hold it. You know, mm-hmm. to think it is so much easier than to live it. Uh, but I would say this is always a calling of good discipleship. So this is what that generation wants. So what you mentioned that conference uh, in YC, uh, yeah. where I did that talk as cheap love has feet. And what you really bothered me then that was, I don't know how many years ago that was Jason, like six or seven or eight. Yeah. It was a while ago. It was a while ago. And I remember I was doing an inner city outreach to women on the street. Of course, all these Aboriginal girls, young girls were being, were missing all across Canada, by the mm. way, but in Edmonton specifically, and no one could give a crap. Like nobody cared. The police wouldn't even open uh, files about it. It was, it's, it, it is, such an indictment on our racist system in Canada. If anyone says Canada isn't racist, I could talk to you for hours and give you specific examples of people that I love who have suffered from racism. But uh, but they just literally, but they were just like, nobody cares because they're indigenous young women that are being trafficked and nobody cares. You know, 80, over 80% of prostituted women in Canada are indigenous, by the way. Mm. And they're, they're not even 2% of the population. So you do the math. Uh, so anyway, I was really ticked off because I'd go to YC and there'd be all these, you know, 16,000 kids worshiping and praising. And then on the same exact street, a few hours later, I would go out with a team of people and we would pick up girls off the street. And uh, it seemed like those two things didn't connect. And it bothered me that we could have 16,000 people saying that Jesus was Lord, that people mattered. You know, they get all fired up about justice and mercy. And then two hours later, there'd be zero difference in that neighborhood. And so I just talked to Mike Love and said, look, I don't, like, this isn't enough, this arena gathering. Like, this can't be, this isn't it. Like, I know this has been working for 20 years, but, like, I think God, I think that it's time to leave the building. You know what I mean? Like, there's time to sort of uh, get out of the, the safety of this environment. And so he was pretty, you know, he was like, ah, I don't know. But I'll tell you what, Danielle, why don't you just do a breakout? And you know, give us an idea. So that's what I announced on the Friday night. I said, love is cheap. Uh, Talk is cheap. Love has feet. If anybody wants to join me during the breakout. Now he had put the breakout at the same time as the, um, all the big bands. Right. So it was like, there was a lot to choose from there. All the big band breakouts, or you could go with Danielle on a prayer walk of the inner city. And, uh, you know, 1500 kids showed up to prayer walk. We thought there'd be like 20. I thought there'd be like a remnant of kids that were like, sure. you know, even if they, all it was, was they just felt guilty. I thought wow. maybe I could 
Maybe I could stir up yeah, 50 yeah. kids. Yeah, yeah. Take the guilt, turn it to something meaningful. <laughs> yeah. And 1,500 kids showed up. I mean, Amazing. it was panic. I, I didn't have the right permits. I mean, it was like a night. I was like, oh, no. This is a, like, wow. I, didn't, I wasn't prepared, which shame on me hmm. for not sensing that not only was God in this, this invitation, but also there's a whole generation of kids that want to do it. Wow. They want to show up. You want to get kids to show up. You know what I mean? You want to inspire a generation to follow Jesus, then give them something that has to do with justice. Uh, it's, it's what, it is the new evangelism. It's what the gospel looks like in, uh, in real life. Hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Danielle, when I hear you chat, what stands out to me is you're like, you're such a good Bible teacher. And I, I've heard you speak in front of tons of crowds. You tell stories from your own life. You open up the Bible in ways I haven't seen before. You draw from a broad variety of sources. Like selfishly as a communicator, I just want to know a little bit about your your reading rhythms. Like I know this is like years of work, but like when, you, when you're when you doing your deep theological work, but then also reading broadly, can you just give me a picture of like how, like what's the source material that's fueling you as you're trying to be so, like you're so in the text and then so at bringing it to this moment. And so tell me a little about your reading and steady rhythms, whether it's in the present or just over the last you know years being in this kind of world. I think uh, for me, I'm really an eclectic uh, reader and person really to tell you the truth. So uh, I love diversity of thought and diversity of background. I, I think it's really, I get, a, I get really curious. Like I keep wanting to pull on the thread. So I always say, if you want to be a really good communicator, uh, cultivate a, a posture of curiosity. Hmm. Like I just, I just want to know, like, and so I get like an itch, you know, that I have to scratch. And so that I'll just keep going down that path. And, uh, and then I've got a few, you know, a few friends that I really highly esteem who are real theological thinkers who I'll call and say, you know, this is what I'm itching at. Do you have some recommended uh, sources or reading around those areas for me? Hmm. Uh, then there was a season, uh, about a year and a half ago, I went to South Africa and I realized that I hadn't read anything by a woman on the South African experience. I, all the stuff that I had read were by men, which is pretty common. Uh, and so I, I just you know, started reading women's, uh, like Winnie Mandela's book, uh, 461 Days, her journal from her own detainment. It was the first time I'd ever actually read a woman's account, which I think is baffling, but anyway. Uh, and then that got me on a, there's all these incredible female uh, voices from Africa. So that got me on like, oh, I'm going to try this one and then try this one. I think it's really easier with Amazon Prime these days, isn't it? <laughs> Where it's like, you like this, what about this? You know, so you can... I try with this uh, sermon prep I've been doing this week. I reread uh, "Engaging the Powers" by um, Walter Wink, which, if, if nobody's read that, it is oh, it is mind-boggling, cha life-changing book hmm. uh, on just the implications of the authority of Jesus in Scripture. It's phenomenal. And um, what was the other book that I really? Oh, Ched Myers. If you haven't read this, uh, "Binding the Strong Man," which is a deep theological uh, reflection on the political ramifications, the socio-political ramifications of the gospel of Mark. Hmm. It is like, uh, like I can't even, I'm just like, I, I have to put it away after a little bit. Cause it's so, you're just like, what on earth? And so I think if you just get some things that you, you know, those times where you're just like curious and you're trying to scratch at that itch. And then I also just aim for some diversity, read some different uh, mm -hmm. sources. Well, I was really challenged. Someone called me out and they just said, all of the commentators you read are white dudes from the mm -hmm. West. And, you know, I probably, I didn't know who these guys were. They were just the commentaries accessible in the library or the ones come free with Logos or whatever it was, right? Those are the ones that were there. And someone really pushed me and was like, hey, you know, find people of color, find people outside of the West, find women commentators and add that to the repertoire and let that hold all of this intention. And it just really, mm -hmm. it's been a real journey of trying to shape my, it's, it's, it's shifting my theological assumptions and um yeah so i mean any any commentators and if you don't have an answer to this it's totally fine but it's gonna kind of put you on the spot but any commentators you go to when you like you mentioned some for mark but any places you go to where like when i'm studying theology these are kind of some of the, the go-to places well i mean i always i'm gonna name a white man now so it's gonna be embarrassing but uh nt Wright is you know sort of my favorite of course and i think that some of the lens on the kingdom stuff that he has is so remarkably rich I just already mentioned James Cone. I, I mean, some of these guys haven't written sort of commentaries right. like the accessibility, which is again, is telling its own story. 
Uh, I've been reading Sandra Rickner right now on the uh, Old Testament theology, just for fun. Uh, and it's going to make me sound like a geek. Just a and, nice Friday um, night. Yeah. And, uh, and then I, I've just cracked open this Evangelical Theologies of Liberation and Justice by May Elise Cannon and Andrea Smith. Hmm. I'm just cracking that open. And I think they've got in this book, particularly they've taken essays and other voices and tr they're trying to do exactly that is highlight mm. really great uh, theologians. So anyway, evangelical theologies of liberation and justice. That sounds good, doesn't it? Oh, thanks for embracing that tangent with me. You got um, it. Hey, as you think about the church in Canada, what are you dreaming? What are you seeing on the horizon? What are you hoping for? Okay, so about a month before the lockdown, the COVID-19 stuff, I did an Amplify Peace local event in Niagara Falls, uh, which was called Chasing Harriet. And we went to retrace the steps of Harriet Tubman when she crossed over into Canada. And, you know, it's really interesting. I'd been studying her life. I was, again, one of those uh, different voices of her herself. You know, it's really interesting that there are only there are 60 children's books 60 children books on the story of Harriet Tubman and only one real biography. Hmm. Just it also fascinating. But anyway, um, and we went to see, we went cause we realized that, wow, this is like an hour and a half from my house uh, is the place where Harriet Tubman crossed over into Canada and led 700 uh, former slaves into, into Canada. And so we just went to listen, like, what was the welcome there? What was it like? Like, what did Harriet have to say? Like, we went to the church that was the place where uh, uh, the AME church there, where she was welcomed and that they were part of this underground railroad uh, landing spot. And it was just so fascinating to me. Um, and one of the things that Harriet said was, you know, she had tried settling in the Northern States and then the Northern States had kind of complied with the oppression of the, the people could come and get the slaves back. And it was just, she was done. She said, I'm done with uncle Sam. That's what she said. And I'm, I'm coming to the promised land. And I think people know this in the underground railroad, even in, when they would communicate with each other in song, whenever they would say, I'm going to the promised land, they meant Canada. Wow. And when you're hearing that, and then you're also, you're realizing like when you, if you ever you have a chance to go, this is fascinating, but the Canadian Canada never even ever marked the spot where Harriet Tubman uh, crossed over and where the underground went. It wasn't even marked. It was a, a fifth grade classroom of students that realized it was in their district. And they petitioned the city and the government to put a marker there to at least say, you know, here's where it happened, which I think and this is, was recently. It wasn't like a long time ago. Seven years ago. Seven wow. years ago, this happened. So, I mean, think about that, like in terms of generational as well. Like you want a generation that cares. Here you go. So, and Harriet Tubman, I mean, Christian of the Christians, right? She's phenomenal. Her faith is relentless. But um, anyway, when I went there and I, I saw this uh, plaque that Harriet had written with a quote of calling Canada the promised land. And I think me, there's about probably 120 of us there together. And Cheryl Nembard, who's a good friend of mine who helped us lead uh, the excursion herself. And we both just kind of like, just kind of wept with the notion that we really are called to be a promised land. I think, and, and ever since that day, I really have been praying that Canada would be what Harriet Tubman had hoped it would be. That it would be, and I mean, I know some other prophetic voices have said Canada has is meant to be a healing place for the nations. Uh, there's, there's so many beautiful things that are within Canada's makeup, you know, DNA. But in, in my heart of hearts, what I pray for Canada is that we would be what Harriet Tubman had hoped we would be. Mm. We'd be a, a refuge. We would be inclusive. We would be a welcome. We would be an example, you know, of what it looks like to be the people of God. Um, and so that's what I'm praying. Canada, be the, be the land you were meant to be. Be the land that the prophetic utterance, you know, of a prophet uh, called you. Mm. Uh, to be that. Be that. Amen. Thanks so much for watching. Before you click to your next video, we want to let you know about a few things we're doing at CCLN that might serve you. First, we've got a bi-weekly podcast featuring conversations with incredible church leaders in Canada and around the world. Just search up the Canadian Church Leaders Podcast on wherever you listen to your podcasts. 
Secondly, every month our team works hard to put together an email newsletter of curated resources and content for pastoral ministry in Canada. So if you want to receive that in your inbox, you can sign up on our website at ccln.ca. Third, this fall, we're starting the Church Leaders Incubator, which is a two-year program created for young pastors to strengthen their character and ministry for long-term effective senior leadership in their church. And so if you wanna learn more about that program, you can just check it out at ccln.ca slash incubator. And lastly, we exist because of the generous donations of people and churches partnering with us in our mission to lift up and serve pastors across Canada. If you're interested in joining our mission financially, we'd love you to consider making a one-time or regular donation. And you can do that at ccln.ca slash partner. Okay, that's it from me. Hope you know that we love you and are cheering you on. We'll see you next time.